Welcome to this webinar uh, on how to turn your buoy into an intelligent data collecting platform. We are gathered here in Bergen, Norway uh, to present to you the exciting news of the MOTUS sensor. Uh, and uh, with me here today, I have a couple of excellent presenters that I will introduce now. Along with me here is Jarle Haltma, he's the product manager. Yes, Hello. thank you, Inga. Um, yes, my name is Jarle Haltma. I'm product manager for uh, the MOTUS and uh, also the other uh, some of the other oceanographic sensors and being with the company for more than 30 years. Yes, you were an old uh, employee of Andorra. And then we have, not old in years, of course, and then we have a Stig Ewen. Why don't you introduce yourself here? Thank you, Inger. My name is uh, Stig Ewen. Um, I work as a uh, business developer here at Andorra for um, the marine transport segment and I have been with Andorra now for uh, almost seven years. Also in charge of us all and making sure that the webinar runs smoothly, we have Rairun Dalla. Yes, thank you, Inger. Um, as Inger said, I'm, I'm taking care of uh, technical uh, issues here today during the webinar. Um, in addition, I'm also the marketing or market manager here at Andorra. I've been with the company for almost 11 years. Um, uh, during this webinar, I also would like to give you some practical information um, this webinar will be recorded and made available uh, in a day or two. Um, also, if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, please type them in in your chat function and we, we will uh, bring them up during the Q&A session uh, at the end of the presentation. So, um, yeah. Yep. Thank you. And uh, lastly, that's, um, this is Inger Graves. I will be uh, sort of interviewing our product manager and business developers today and uh, making sure that we can convey the message here on our uh, new MOTUS sensor. Um, and I think what we will do is, because we see that we have a lot of people on the, the bridge here, uh, we will go through a little bit about, uh, you know, the background of who Andra is in short. And Jarl, since you've been here the longest, why don't you take that away? Thank you. Um, yeah, since UNRWA started back in the 60s, our focus has uh, been on uh, in instrument, uh, current meters and water quality sensor uh, measuring in the ocean. It all started with a mechanical recording uh, current meters. Since then, UNRWA has evolved uh, into today's focus on um, multi-parameter platforms smart sensor and systems. But we are now uh, marking a new chapter in the honor of history by introducing uh, three methods of uh, measuring waves. Uh, Pressure-based non-directional wave uh, is from a standalone sensor that also can be used as a sensor on the uh, Seaguard multi-parameter platform. Then we have the acoustic wave direction that is used in combination with uh, the current profiler, uh, the Seaguard uh, DCP wave. And uh, then, like we want to introduce today, is the MOTUS directional wave sensor that either can be used as part of a buoy or it can be used as a standalone unit. Yes, and, and so, Sieg, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what the MOTUS timeline looks like? Because the MOTUS isn't, isn't brand new. No, the, the MOTUS isn't brand new. We, uh, when we were finished with developing the sensor in 2017, we then developed it, uh, sorry, deployed it on uh, two different buoys. Uh, it was the YSI EMM 2.0, and it was the Tideland SP138. So we deployed them for two years in offshore location on the west coast of Norway. Um, and we have had wave conditions up to about 20 meters wave height in that site. Um, as I said, they have been deployed two years and now our um, experiences from these buoys are so good that we want to make that available for other users on different buoy platforms as well. Mm. And also, as you will talk about later, we have had experiences with many different platforms now that our customers have utilized. 
Yeah. And uh, we will uh, take a look at uh, how how we can adapt this sensor to different types of buoys. Um, so just to give a little bit of information about uh, things that you can find on our webpage that may be interesting, we have some materials uh, for uh, from um, the MOTUS itself, the MOTUS white paper that was released when we released the MOTUS buoys. Um, there are two white papers that you can find on our webpage. In addition, as Jarla was alluding to, we also have the opportunity to measure waves from our bottom-mounted ADCP, or what we call the Seagar 2 DCP. Uh, and there's also a white paper here and available on the webpage on Android.com that tells you a little bit about how this has, uh, is working uh, in the, and what methods that are used. But also, very interestingly, the comparison between measuring waves from a bottom-mounted profiler and from a buoy, and the opportunities and the advantages that there are with each method. So take take a look at that. Go to our webpage or get in touch with us if you need help finding this material, which may be interesting for those of you who want to go into more detail. Steve, why don't you give us a uh, sort of sl uh, overview of uh, our agenda today? Thank you, Inger. Um, First, my colleague Jarle will take us through the advantages of the MOTU sensor, how it is working, and the parameters it gives out. Then I will continue with considerations for selecting the right buoy platform in regards to shape, size, and buoyancy before we all look into some mooring consideration, integration, and then also adding currents to your buoy. And then in the end, we will leave some time for a Q&A session. Yes, and as Raiden said, please submit questions in the chat functionality as we go along, and hopefully we will be able to cover all your questions, or either today or after the webinar. All right, let's get into it. So, um, Motus Wave Sensor, why don't you remind us, Darla, uh, summary of the features, uh, main features of this sensor? Yes, the Motus is an advanced but still easy to use uh, sensor. Uh, it is designed uh, to be flexible and easy to configure to fit uh, any third-party buoy. Uh, but uh, in, uh, compared to other sensors, it's, uh, e uh, it's more flexible because most sensor, wave sensors are made specific for one specific buoy. Uh, the sensor is developed based on our experience from oceanographic sensor, where always uh, we have a high focus on high accuracy and low power. It's also um, the sensor are using a built-in algorithm that compensates for the buoy response, and because of this, it can be used uh, on both small and uh, larger buoys. Uh, many buoys contain magnetic uh, material as part of uh, the buoy structure. Uh, this can uh, interfere with the compass inside the sensor and disturb the wave uh, direction parameters. To solve this problem, the motors may also be use uh, external compass uh, placed away from the magnetic disturbance, for example, in the mast. Ideally, a uh, sensor should be placed in the center of uh, gravity, but uh, in most cases, this is not uh, possible. Uh, to compensate for this, we offer an uh, X, Y, and Z offset uh, compensation uh, for off-center uh, positioning. Thank you, Erla. And uh, these features, what do they actually uh, how do they actually impact how this sensor can be used uh, on, on different types of buoys? Yeah. As I said, the sensor is easier to uh, integrate than other sensors. Uh, for example, we have the compensation for uh, location and uh, buoy type. Uh, Steve will later on uh, explain more about this, how we can adapt this to uh, any buoy of any size. Uh, it also has an open ASCII protocol. This means that it's very easy to integrate the result from the sensor into any uh, um, any uh, 
uh, software or display. It uh, also has the external compass option where you can put uh, an RS-222 compass or GPS uh, directly to the sensor and then use this instead of the internal compass. Uh, yeah, it's also a, it also has a very robust packaging and the sensor can handle a knockdown down to 30 meters. It can be placed uh, outside on the buoy and that's important uh, uh, because, uh, uh, yeah, in many cases there is no room inside the buoy. We also had uh, some experience from a customer that forgot to fix the sensor to the buoy, and even if it was moving around inside the buoy, it's, it still gives uh, high quality data for all deployments. And low power is uh, always important to reduce the need for solar panel and also to be able to operate in area with uh, less daylight, like in Norway. Mm. And all these features gives uh, the user the possibility to mount a sensor in any position uh, on the buoy without uh, removing mag magnetic uh, materials and it can even be used on steel buoys. You don't need uh, the big uh, solar panel. It, it can be used in a rough area, like in Norway again. And uh, easy integration to most loggers that can read RS-222 sensors. Thank you. So now we sort of see it from the outside in terms of what the sensor can do for you and how it can be utilized on different types of buoys and integrated with different types of systems. So why don't we go one level down and look and see look inside of the sensor at least for a an overview of, of the uh, of the technology used here. Yes. Um, the components we are using are standard available components. So it's no secret behind that. But the difference is uh, how uh, how we treat the data and what algorithm we put into the sensor. So the accuracy is improved and the noise reduced by sampling the movement uh, 100 times a second. Uh, we have also added uh, advanced filtering technology and mechanical dampening to uh, remove unwanted uh, vibration. The main component inside the EM, is the EMU uh, that consists of uh, accelerometers, three axis accelerometer, measuring change in velocity. It has also a three axis gyro, measuring the angular velocity, and a three axis magnetometer, measuring the magnetic field. Together, this gives a full picture of the buoy mo movement. Okay. Um, so, with all this technology, what is the MOTUS uh, sensor actually outputting? What is it calculating based on its IMU readings uh, today? Uh, the most important parameters vary from region to region. Uh, all parameters are based on the same raw data that is measured by the EMU. So, uh, all these parameters is then just uh, a matter of algorithm to calculate uh, the parameters that are typically uh, based on a standard. Uh, if you need a different parameters, in most cases we can also add this uh, to the sensor and the user can specific in, uh, specify in each uh, case which parameter to output. Significant wave height and wave period is the most used and there are available different versions of these uh, uh, parameters depending on where you are using the sensor. Uh, spectrum is also available to describe the wave more fully. Hmm. So they're both in this, I can see both frequency and time base, time, or time domain uh, parameters. Uh, hmm. When would you use each of these? Yeah. Uh, the time uh, domain describes the variation as function of time, as the name says. For example, the vertical buoy position as function of time. Uh, frequency domain uh, 
describes uh, the waves in terms of the energy distribution uh, as function of uh, frequency. Uh, the ocean does not contain clean surface uh, waves. It's, it's a mix of uh, different uh, sinus waves. So in, in the wave, uh, in the time uh, domain, these are displayed as one, uh, measuring every uh, measuring point. But in uh, frequency uh, domain, all these parameters are given with the different frequency and the energy in each of them. Okay. Thank you. So that was the uh, a short overview of the MOTUS output, how it works, and some of the functionality that makes it particularly adaptable to many different buoys. Uh, we're going to now go into a little bit of uh, integration considerations. Uh, that you have to take into account when integrating in a new buoy platform. And the first, uh, first we just want to introduce uh, a typical wave period and frequency just to sort of uh, preface what we're talking about in terms of understanding how your buoy responds. So obviously what we're measuring in, in this, uh, what mostly is of interest when measuring waves in the environments that we typically operate are you know, wind-driven waves or swell. And these are waves that go up to, uh, you know, about maybe 20, 30 second period, but maybe mostly around 10 for swell and a little bit like around three or four second period for, for wind-driven waves. Um, when, when selecting parameters, or when, sorry, when selecting a buoy, keeping in mind what sort of waves that you're interested in is one of the considerations that uh, you will have to uh, be aware of when uh, selecting the size of the buoy and the type of buoy to use. Um, in MOTUS, you will get out data for both your wind, uh, wind driven waves and your swell as two different parameters. Uh, so you will always have the overview of the two different types of waves that you're experiencing. But let's now look at how this affects the measurement. And first, uh, let's look at how the size a buoy uh, impact uh, the measurements here. And I'm going to start a little video to the right there. Hopefully you'll see that. Uh, Steve, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the factors regarding size uh, and more? Yeah. <clears throat> so when we developed the motor sensor, we also had to look at what was happening underneath the buoy. Uh, we did this with our scientific partners. And the outcome of that was this simulation you can see going there on the right side now. Uh, taking into the effect of the mooring uh, and everything that the current and everything that's coming along there. Um, the size of the buoy is important because larger buoys will dampen smaller waves. In order to get an idea of the accuracy possible from different buoys, uh, we have developed a small tool uh, to help on integrating the sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, if you really want to go thoroughly into this, uh, you should consider one of two options, either renting a buoy and uh, placing out a known buoy with your buoy, or you can integrate, invest in a, a much more expensive tool. But this will give you a, a good overview. So <clears throat> by inserting the buoy size and shape into the tool, it outputs an overview of the dampening from the buoy on waves of different frequencies. This is shown in the picture by three different lines there. You see the, the red, the yellow, and the blue. Um, the yellow one is the average one, and that is what we are expecting that you will be experiencing when you integrate the sensor. And then you have the best case scenario, and then you have the worst case scenario, mm. basically. Mm. Um, ideally, there would be no dampening on the wave, and the dampening factor of one, all buoys will have some dampening, and this will have a dampening factor between zero and one. As you can see in the example out to the right there, you see multiple lines. You see a black and a red all the way at the top there. That is a small orbital, orbital uh, test buoys that we use. Um, one is called the uh, ADI spare. And um, then you also see some other buoys that uh, we have uh, tested on, and then we have also tested on some, some bigger buoys. Um, a dampening factor of 0 0.9 means 
a 10% dampening of the waves of this frequency. So if you look at the example graph on the, uh, sorry, the red line, um, you can see it has a dampening of waves starting about 0 0.2 hertz or five second wave period. Uh, this means that any waves with a higher frequency than, than 0 0.2 hertz will be dampened by this buoy. So if it has larger waves, it will not be so much affected, but the smaller waves mm. will affect it much more. So this gives a good indication uh, at the early stage when selecting the buoy, uh, what sort of dampening that will occur. And you can hold that up against sort of your deployment location to see if it's exactly. efficient in terms exactly. of the accuracy. So let's get to another factor then, it's uh, the, the buoyancy. Um, and when I think of buoyancy, I think of a cork floating in the ocean and you push it down. Uh, when you push it down, it quickly pops back up. Uh, but how does this play a role in uh, wave measurement? So the buoyancy says something about the response of the buoys to displacement. Uh, the waves will change the amount of displaced water and give a change in the buoyancy force. Uh, this depends on the change of the waterline and the area of the waterline or the volume. Uh, the higher the area at the waterline is versus the mass of the buoy, the quicker the buoy will compensate for the waves hitting the buoy, moving the waterline. So buoy A will, uh, will be correct for waves much, uh, sorry, uh, buoy A will correct for waves much quicker than buoy type B in this picture here. Mm -hmm. um, it's also possible to calculate this by looking at the areas of the water line and the weight of the buoy. So if you look here, then the, um, the A is the water line area, T is the density of seawater, G is the gravity constant, and then M is the mass or the, or the weight of the buoy. Um, so when we calculate the resonance frequency on the uh, Tidal SP1, uh, SP138 T buoy, it's, uh, it's about 8.7. Mm. And that works quite well. Yes. All right. So, so that has to do with the buoyancy and the response. And how about shape? Yeah. So, <clears throat> the best wave direction buoys are symmetrical with regards to the vertical axis, as the waves and the current will be rotating the buoy uh, at all times, basically. Um, if you look at these buoys from the top. Uh, then you will see that buoy A and buoy B uh, are quite different in the shape. And buoy type A will work much better for directional waves uh, rather than buoy type B. Um, mm, so it's basically it's the direction that suffers the it's QM. The direction, the wave yeah. height will be quite good. If the if the waves are quite big, there's no issue mm. with it at all, basically. Mm. And then, of course, we can do some compensation also. Um, so let's then go to moorings. And you alluded to this a little earlier. We've done a lot of testing with moorings in our demo station and in our deployments. Um, what are the factors to consider here? Yeah, so when you, when you look at the moorings, um, our experiences uh, on our deployments here from Andra is that when you're underneath um, 20 meters of water depth, then you can just use a single point mooring consisting only of chain or a combination of chain and rope, depending a little bit of, of your location there. Um, it's important to stabilize the buoy a little bit um, to make sure that it, especially when you are on a plastic buoy, uh, to get enough weight on it so it's not dancing around too much. Uh, so on the SP138, we weigh it down with about 200 kilograms, roughly. Um, and the mooring hanging in the water should not exceed more than about 300 kilograms um, on the SP138 or similar buoys on the 175 mm. meter platform. Mm. Um, the swivel is also very important and using a high quality swivel um, and to talk to the um, the, uh, chain suppliers in your region and get um, get some information of uh, what their experiences are 
with swivels and what is working in your region is quite important. So that's in order to make sure the buoy turns nicely in the wave yes. and do not wear out. Yeah. If you look at, um, at deployments for more than 20 meters, um, then we have good experience using a combination of chain and uh, elastic cord and rope and then chain at the bottom again. Mm -hmm. Um, that gives uh, you a little bit more uh, easy way to extend your deployment deck also. Uh, if you want to add more uh, length to the rope, it's now uh, no issue there. Mm -hmm. It won't do anything with the weight of the mooring. Uh, so we do have some available designs there that we share quite openly and uh, and give our experience based on our deployments. Yeah. Good. And then, of course, there's marine growth. Um, can't stop that, at least not without any major measures. So there will be a small blue shell farm on these buoys after a while. How does that impact our measures? Yeah. So the fouling increases the friction between the buoy and the wave. And this is actually an advantage on a wave direction buoy. Mm -hmm. um, However, the heavy fouling on the mooring in combination with the steady current on the mooring can lead to reduced quality of the wave measurement. So it, uh, it goes both ways, basically. Mm. Uh, we recommend that the mooring gets cleaned uh, at certain intervals. Um, at the same interval as you're inspecting your mooring, and depending on your local conditions, but at least once a year. And in heavy fouling regions, you have to do it more often. Uh, but for the buoy itself, it's uh, it's not a, such a big issue. Mm. Okay, so let's uh, move on. We've sort of summarized what we talked about a little bit into an integration guideline. And please, please feel free to reach out to us or to your local asylum uh, representatives to get guidelines on um, based on what our experiences are here as we have integrated a lot of buoys with the MOSIS already. Um, so uh, what is um, sort of the first uh, point on the uh, integration uh, guideline? Yeah, I would suggest that you understand what you are interested in measuring in regards to wave area and the size, and also selecting uh, the platform you want to use. And then I would follow up with uh, run those into the tool and look at the size of the buoy and get the dampening factors and then see okay do you actually have a buoy that is fit for integration and getting the accuracy that i want mm. and then uh, what about positioning then uh, Yarla? yeah the position is of course uh, dependent on on the buoy but with the x y and z uh, offset adjustment you you should put it as close to the center of gravity as possible, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and these parameters is plugged right into the most system as part of configuration over a serial port, for instance. Yeah, yeah. this is a, it's also, a, we have a software called a AD, ADI Resum Collector, which you, which you can use to answer this configuration. Yeah, so you can really configure either sort of very basic on serial or using our configuration tool. Um, so uh, what about the magnetic interference? What would you recommend doing there? Yeah, of course, if if your buoy has some uh, magnetic material, you, one uh, option is to remove that material, but that's also very expensive and difficult in some time. So uh, if you then have the possibility to put an uh, uh, external compass in, in the mast, a way from uh, the magnetic influence, then it can easily be connected to the sensor with a cable. Uh, so, yeah. And how would you sort recommend of, sort of finding out if you have a magnetic interference? Oh, it's simply before you do the deployment, just uh, use uh, a compass. You can even use the compass inside uh, the motors and measuring and see when you move it close to the, the buoy and see if it interferes with the direction. Hmm. Okay, so and what is what about configuration, uh, Steve? Yeah, so if you're using the smart card data logger, uh, then you just set the motors into the ICAP mode, and then it's basically just a plug-and-play solution for it. Mm -hmm. If 
you're using uh, a third party logger, uh, a Campbell logger or, or something else, um, then you have to configure it as the RS232, the sensor that it, mm -hmm. and then parse the output string accordingly. Mm -hmm. And this is all described, uh, the output string is described very well in our manuals for the most that you will be getting uh, made available to you. Uh, and how about the mooring? You said a little bit about it already, but just a quick... Yeah, I would say summary. that uh, basic guidelines, less than 20 meter, one point chain mooring gives good results. If more than 20 meter, then you could consider using a combination of elastic cord, rope and chain. Um, if you have very long mooring, then you might consider cutting out the elastic cord and just going with the rope and chain combination there. Mm. Uh, we have good experience with both, so uh, it's, it's, we do have yeah. them. We have it in the in the white papers. Yeah, so please check out the white papers for more information on that as well. Um, then, uh, as we uh, alluded to in the beginning of the webinar, you know your accuracy requirements. Something you got to keep in mind when selecting the buoy. If you have a wave direction accuracy, which is the one that's firstly uh, impacted, uh, we say less than five degrees. So consider you want something uh, more accurate measurement on your wave direction than five degrees, uh, consider correlating to an existing reference buoy, particularly if you have a bigger buoy. Um, that is really where you need to consider it. If it's a smaller buoy like R1.75, uh, that may not be needed. And if it's very close to what the buoys that we have already have extensive data on, you can also maybe skip it. So if, if get in touch with us, we can also look and see where we are with similar buoys that we have correlation results for. Um, when you are going to use the reference buoy, if you decide to do that, um, it needs to be close, uh, positioned close by. Uh, not so close that the moorings get tangled into each other, but uh, close enough that they are looking at the same wave field, and particularly good if you could put it in the same location that you would like to measure the waves in the long run, so you actually end up seeing the waves that you'll be interested in. But like I said, this may not be already, already, uh, always needed based on previous experience or the size of the buoy. So then, easily enough, integrate the system and deploy. That's easier said than done, of course, but this at least gives you a sort of an overview of the steps required in terms of getting the MOTIS at least and the consideration around wave measurements from different buoys. So let's look a little bit at the, some integration packages and also some results. And first, the slide on the integration packages, uh, Siege. Yeah, so we prepared uh, just a few packages that uh, we thought made sense to, to have available. Uh, the one not showing here is, of course, just the most the sensor and a cable alone. Um, and also the motors with the smart card data logger and the cables needed. Um, but basically, we have put it into two different ones. Um, for integrators utilizing their own logger, the MOTUS and a current profiler, or the MOTUS and a single point current sensor. And then we have added one with the smart card um, for, the, for the same. Uh, also, we have all the, uh, the cables needed in standard and custom specified cable length and types. Uh, when you have the uh, smart card with, you also get the post processing software included. Uh, which has its own value, of course. Um, and then the uh, plug and play configuration there. Yeah. So if you want to add something else to it, it's quite easy. If you want to distribute uh, everything on AIS, you can just do that. Yeah, so this, the smart card logger is, of course, a very integrated part of the uh, Ondera uh, sort of uh, backbone. Yeah. And it will allow you to, to really make uh, use of all the functionality of communication between the sensors and easy integration, like you say, plug and play and directly communication to third party uh, communication um, hardware. Um, but like uh, Steve is also saying here that the, these sensors are available, they basically can be integrated into any logger with their cable um you know uh, in combination with our current features could you just say a quick uh, thing about the 
profiler versus single points, and when what what is the advantage of each of those? Uh, yeah. So current? if if you look at the profiler, when you install that on the buoy, of course you typically gonna be uh, somewhere between a meter and two meter down, and then you're gonna have a, a blanking zone from the instrument itself, and then looking downward. So in reality, you're often in somewhere between two and a half and, and four meters before you have the first usable cell to actually get your data from. If you want to have the uh, the surface current uh, much higher up, then you can use the single point sensor instead, which will give you the current at the exact installation point. Hmm. Yeah. And that's the advantage with the, with the blanking zone because then it won't take into affect uh, moon pools or other ways you put it into the water. Hmm. So they each have their own use, and you can also combine them. So, uh, so these are the uh, packages. That was a little bit of a secret <laughs> combining them. But now you gave it sort of a uh, giveaway. Huh? Yeah, it was. Uh, let's just look a little bit at what buoys, some of the buoys that we have uh, uh, are working on or have installed the sensor on. Um, why don't you say a little bit about the different ones here? Yeah. So. Um, the first one you see up in the left there is the, the uh, Titan. It's a 1.75 meter diameter buoy. Uh, we have very good experiences with that buoy type. Uh, we have had a lot of deployments on it. Uh, on the side for it, you see the um, Autonite USV, the unmanned surface vessels that Autonite may, makes. Um, so they have integrated the sensors onto some of the vessels and have made it available there. If you look down on the left-hand side, you see a, a bigger Trident buoy, the SP285. It has a two and a half meter diameter. Um, so it's quite a lot bigger. Um, then we have a customer who's also uh, installing it on some lighter buoy, and they are about five point five by three meter uh, in size so they're quite big and uh, they are uh, not so uh, optimal for uh, for short waves uh, and then you have the EMM 2.0 from Thailand which is 1.8 meter diameter and then in the UK they have been working on installing some uh, multi sensors on some uh, some bigger buoys I can't remember the diameter on, <laughs> on that one. Um, and let's, let's just look quickly at the SC-138 implementation, which is the buoy that we've been mostly profiling with the most sensor up until now. Um, this has different types of packages that you can put on. It's, of course, communication and uh, you know, data management inside of the buoy. Uh, we mostly base it on the on the uh, uh, under a smart guard uh, data logger managing the system, but other sensors and other integration centers have used other loggers. Um, so as we said, the current measurement sensor, whether it is a single point or profiler, is typically then put in a moon pool and hanging below the buoy. Uh, there is a uh, you can also customize a water quality sensor pack. Uh, we've also typically used here the XO from YSI, which has a wiper and keeps it falling free uh, and ensures longer deployments. Uh, we have uh, power solutions, obviously, uh, mounted on the buoy. And in addition, is the buoy can be used as aids to navigation, so it can be featured in many colors, both cardinal and um, um, lateral buoys, and also different types of uh, lanterns on the buoy. Um, so really, uh, the, the buoys that we feature typically have either just MOTIS or a wide range of sensors on the buoy, depending on the application. And here, for those of you who are a little more electronically uh, interested, there this is a typical drawing of uh, one of our deliveries that went to a uh, aquaculture site, where they're measuring wave, waves, obviously, with the MOTIS sensor. Uh, they're measuring currents in a profile below the, the buoy. And in addition, there's two channels for, uh, for data. It's direct on AIS, meaning that any vessel in the area will receive this information and be able to directly uh, utilize it. But there's also just a, uh, a GSM communication 
units that takes it to shore and uh, displays it in the control room of this site. So uh, this is just a one of those uh, build-ups that we have been providing with the MOSIS wave buoy when we survive, when we supply the entire buoy. Uh, just a little bit about accuracy. Uh, this is much more about this in the white papers, but since we won't have time to go through it here, I'll just point to that there's comparisons in the white papers on, of course, both uh, wave heights and direction, comparison with uh, data well, and with two different buoys, internal buoys from Zyland towards the data well. Please consult our web uh, website and white papers there. And if we are very lucky, right, we'll also put them in the, uh, <laughs> in the send out after this, uh, this webinar. Uh, so uh, we have reached the final uh, couple of slides here, and um, Sieg, why don't you um, summarize uh, some of the uh, main points of our webinar today? Yeah, sure. Um, since larger buoys dampen the smaller waves, the motor sensor is ideal as the internal wave coefficients can be tuned to amplify the signals uh, on the shorter wave. Uh, and then given that the, the water tightness and the off-center compensation of this, the motor sensor, it is ideal to place it in a number of places of any buoy, uh, also on the outside. And then if you want to integrate the, uh, the motor sensor on a buoy where magnetism is of concern, uh, a compass can be connected directly to the sensor. Um, so let's say, you, like Yara said, if you have a steel buoy, and then you can make uh, use of a GPS compass and then make a successful integration on measuring direction of waves from a steel buoy. Um, and then I would say also that the, the accuracy is quite good on, uh, on uh, the 1.75 meter platform, also down to about five, six centimeters yeah. of wave height in small and in, in a closed fjord uh, environment. area yeah. environment. Yeah. And this is some data that we also have in the white papers for the MOSIS buoy. Absolutely. So that's it's a good reference for anyone who wants to uh, integrate the MOSIS sensor. Uh, on our web page, we have uh, a uh, overview of the MOSIS uh, and also of our other uh, wave measure, measurement devices or wave sensors, uh, both the pressure-based wave sensor, which measures non-directional wave, uh, and our acoustic uh, profiler measuring waves from the bottom uh, location. So uh, please consult uh, andra.com for uh, just more information about measuring waves. Um, and uh, now I think we've reached the end of our uh, regularly scheduled agenda. So um, we have have some questions come in, and this is where we need to start gathering our papers and figure out which one because. I see at least 10 questions, and I don't, I see actually 12 questions here. So um, I will start, and then maybe we can do a couple now, and then we'll do and get back to all of you who've asked questions. Uh, and also, please, please feel free to reach out for us, to us after the, um, the webinar as well. Uh, so the first question I have is, is um, regarding uh, maintenance, and I guess, Yarla, maybe you can you can answer the maintenance question. Um, what is the main, are the maintenance needs of the most sensor? Uh, does it need to come in for calibration or what is the typical need for that? Oh, uh, normally the sensor is uh, long-term stable. It uh, don't need any specific recalibration unless it's been uh, physically damaged. Um, so, uh, but uh, we expect that maybe after five or five to ten years, you have to change uh, the dampening, the silicone dampers inside the sensor. But um, that also depends on the use and how rough the weather is. If it's a lot of movement, uh, uh, a lot of high uh, waves then it will be less time, but in most cases, even longer periods. Uh, OK, so uh, let's see here. I got one I think it's for you, Steve. Um, is it possible to deploy on a totally metallic buoy? Yes, in short. 
we believe so. We haven't done it ourselves, but if you use the GPS compass and you have the power budget available for actually running a GPS compass on that buoy, uh, yes, it should not be affected by, uh, uh, by the magnetism there. Uh, and this question here is uh, uh, maybe a clarifying one. Have you experienced in a real in a real time transmission of collected data? Uh, I think this is uh, for you, Arlen. Yeah, we we uh, of course most of these uh, buoys that we already have in the field are uh, transmitting data uh, real time to to shore. Uh, so yeah. So we have a uh, different solution depending on uh, the site where what sort of uh, transmission you want. I don't think we have any installations where we don't do real time. Well, I, we? I would call it near real time. Mm -hmm. It's not real time, real time. It's, it's very close to, to real time. Yeah, we're talking uh, not uh, hours. <laughs> we are talking <laughs> seconds and uh, sometimes minutes, depending yeah. on, the, on the receiver side. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, if if real depending on what you your definition of real time it's it's within. And also, if you look at if you're doing then uh, what type of waves you are actually measuring. Yeah, you have of course to sample. Have to, do you have to sample for some time before the measurements have uh, have been done? And typical intervals we run in. Uh, typical is uh, all from 20 to uh, or 10 to 30 minutes. It's uh, you need at least. Uh, uh, 10 minutes to get an average of the wave. That's a good, good yeah. average, yeah. Okay, uh, I am looking at my watch here. I think uh, we will do... Um... I saw just one question I would like to answer there on the uh, Gil and um, Vaisala sensors. Okay, and that was here. Um... We have too many questions. Yeah. Okay, here, yeah. Do you have any experience in integrating with third-party sensors, i.e. GIL or Vaisala? Yes, Steve. Yes, so we use both of them. Uh, we don't have any, um, any preference uh, over one or the other. Uh, both of them we have good results with. Um, I would say that, uh, yes, it's very easy to integrate them when you're using the smart card data logger. So, um, yeah. But we, you cannot take the uh, compass heading from the guild. No. Then um, that is not recommended. Yeah. So, so you can integrate them for using a, as mass stations. As mass stations. Yeah. Uh, but we do recommend another type of compass if you want to use external compass. Yeah. So we use them on the Motus buoys. Yeah. We use them all the time. Yeah. So these are our uh, preferred, some of our preferred vendors there. Um, let's see. Um, there is also a question of maintenance intervals for the buoy and mooring. I think you answered a little bit maybe after this question came in, but uh, maintenance intervals for for moorings you mentioned. Um, yeah, so you have to look at your local conditions uh, because what we experience in the uh, colder and uh, darker climate is something different than what you are experienced in, in the Middle East or, uh, or other areas. Um, so you actually have to uh, to look into local conditions more. Uh, when you have heavy fouling and high salinity and, and those things, you, you actually need to look more into to, uh, to your intervals there. Here up in the in the north, maybe you just uh, do an inspection and a cleaning once a year. In the Middle East, maybe you do it once a month. Mm. Uh, so the Spanish deployments have done it, I guess, once a year, right? Yes. Yeah. But, um, the most, but the most of sensor doesn't mean anything. No, it's always about what's in the water and the most of sensor sitting on the way and the buoy is pretty protected. Uh, I'm going to ask answer the last question here and then I think the rest of it we're going to have to answer uh, after the fact. Uh, our environment has typical wind waves of some six to seven seconds uh, and 0.8. Uh, meters h one third with max up to four meters and our buoys are metallic with two meter diameter so I'm do you foresee that this is um, a problem and we have a 1.75 meter that we have correlated down to about six centimeter we have good results down to about yeah five six centimeters wave. 
Yeah. And then uh, uh, below that, we had a slightly overestimation uh, below that, but mm. it was pretty down to, to about five, six centimeters. Yeah, so this buoy is not so much greater than that, performed very well uh, in very low level conditions. I have to look exactly at, at uh, what we have experienced in a similar environment that you're describing, but uh, uh, we were very surprised to see how, how well our 1.75 meter buoy performed. Uh, even in low, uh, in smaller waves, smaller wind-driven waves. And uh, as long as you're also uh, sort of adhering to what we recommend in terms of moorings and so on, and are, of course, making sure that there is no uh, interference of your compass using an external compass since you're having a, a metallic buoy, um, the, the likelihood of success is high, but please get in touch with us and we can maybe look a little bit and more the, at your uh, application. And the tool is available for actually looking at it. Yeah, so you can use that tool as a first indication. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm all, almost sweating here because there's still questions popping in and uh, we will not be able to answer more. And I don't know typing away over here. Uh, but I think what we'll do is we'll uh, wrap up the webinar for today. Uh, you will, all of you who have enrolled, uh, will be receiving an email with further information on white papers, with a recording, and uh, and for those of you who ask questions, we will try to reach out for you uh, to answer your questions uh, after the fact, those of you who were not answered on, during the seminar. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Arla and Raiden. And uh, hopefully, we'll hear more applications soon. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.